Well, my name is Clarissa Stevens, and I'm the Connections Pastor here. And today, I'm going to be closing out our month of messages on the Holy Spirit. Uh, we kicked it off with Pastor Denny Rodney. He talked about the upper room. He talked to us about what an upper room lifestyle really is and having a, a lifestyle of fellowship and service and th- what the church was all about. Pastor Destiny on Mother's Day gave us an overview of the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the work that he does in a believer's life. Last Sunday, Pastor Josh Kraft, how many of you were here last Sunday? That was good. Talked to us about God's design and our build. He came all the way from Frisco, Texas to give us the word. And he told us that we should not build our lives our way, but we should build our lives God's way. It was so good. If you've missed any of those messages, if you're watching online and you missed any of those messages, go back and watch them, but not right now because I got something to say. Okay. I'm going to continue today to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit and the new life that we have with him in Christ. I'm going to pray first. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the joy that has been in this house already today. Thank you for the laughter. Thank you for the worship. Lord, we are so honored to be a part of your kingdom. (laughs) Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die in our place. You have done for us what we could never do for ourselves, and you continue to do it every single day. All honor, all praise, all glory unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Ephesians is a letter that the Apostle Paul, a pioneer and leader in the early church, wrote. And it went to Ephesus, but it also, we believe, went to some other churches. It's a very, very foundational letter. It teaches us so many things. This is where we find, you know, the armor of God that we're supposed to put on every day that we talk about. And so many other things. And one of the big things that he talks about is our new life in Christ and our identity. So Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, Paul writes, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Paul says, don't live like the Gentiles or the unbelievers. He says, their lives are the results of their empty, purposeless thinking. Their hearts are hard and their heads are empty. How many of you want to be described like that? Paul says, you can't live like that anymore. Verse 19 They, speaking of the unbelievers, have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality. They live by their feelings. They're greedy to practice every kind of impurity. They want more and more and more of the wrong thing. Verse 20. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Where is the truth found? In Jesus, very good. You pass, you pass. So Paul goes on. Here's what you were taught, verse 22. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Verse 23, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self. Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul writes, you must put off the old and put on the new, right? We don't just put off the old, we put on the, ah. And he tells us what the new life is all about. Being created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Hmm. He continues, verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another, speaking of the body. Verse 26. 
Be angry and do not let sin and do be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. That's hard, huh? Verse 27. And give no opportunity to the devil. Ooh. Verse 27 in another translation says, give the devil no opportunity to work. This is one of those verses that can help our theology if we let it. We ask each other questions like, do you think the devil's attacking my marriage? Maybe. But maybe a better question is, have I given the devil an opportunity to attack my marriage? Have I been lying? Have I been trying to control my family and my friends with my anger and my bad attitude? Have I opened up the door and let him in? One day I'll preach that sermon, but we'll keep going. Verse 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Did you hear that? But only, uh uh-oh, such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. I love these verses because it's not just about stopping something. It's about becoming someone different. The thief should no longer steal. He should actually become someone who's generous. The person who talks all the time and says things they shouldn't say shouldn't just stop talking and saying those things. They should start saying things that will actually give grace to those who hear. It's about transformation. Then Paul drops a bomb in the middle of it all. Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Paul identifies the Holy Spirit as a person with feelings. Not a feeling, not in it. He says, don't make him sad. Don't make him sorrowful. Don't make the spirit that God gave you to make you new grieve. Verse 31, he picks right back up. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Verse 32, the new person should be kind to one another, tender-hearted instead of hard-hearted, forgiving one another. Ah, this is the one we love. As God in Christ forgave you. Why is Paul saying all of these hard things to them and to us? I know. Because we have a high calling. We have a high calling. Think about it. We are called to become like God. That's a high calling. We are called to love difficult, dysfunctional people like us. That's a high calling, isn't it? We are called to lay down our lives, serve others, and make disciples. Anybody tried to make a disciple lately? It is a high calling and it is a hard calling. We are called to be witnesses. Witnesses empowered by the Holy Spirit, by God himself, and not just any witnesses, credible witnesses trustworthy, faithful, integral, people who can testify that Jesus is Lord, not just with their mouth, but with their life and in action. 
We have a high calling. And I think we know it. (laughs) But often we don't live up to it because we struggle with this question, how in the world (laughs) do we live up to what we've been called to? Verses 23 and 24 again I think they give us an answer in the New Living Translation. It says, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Emphasis added. (laughs) Let the Spirit. How do we live up to our high calling? It starts with us letting the Spirit work. Allowing him to do the good work in us that he's trying to do, giving him an opportunity. If you're taking notes, write this down. I must give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to work. I must give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to work. Here's what we have to understand about what it means to be a Christ follower. It involves more than confessing a belief and saying a prayer. It's a part of this thing called salvation. But if we continue to breathe after deciding to follow Jesus, news flash, there's more to the story. It's called sanctification. Sanctification. And I love this definition because I think it helps explain what's really happening. It's a progressive transformation into who we are in Christ. God set apart children, which requires a continual renewal of our minds, our beliefs, attitudes, and thoughts. A progressive transformation into who we are in Christ. Yes, we are children of God, but how many of you know we got to learn how to act like it? Why do we have to go through a progressive transformation? Because there are things in life that we must heal from and deal with along the way. Anybody besides me? Things that don't just get removed or are instantly transformed because we decide to follow Jesus. In verse 22, Paul calls it the old self. Anybody know their old self? Mm. Another place he talks about it as the sinful nature. In another place, he identifies it as what is earthly in us. We have to deal with our sinful, fleshly, earthly nature. Real quick, three things that aren't instantly renewed when we decide to follow Jesus. We need to think about this. The first one is this, our memories. Our memories. Definition of memory. The mental capacity or faculty of retaining and reviving facts, events, impressions, etc., or of recalling or recognizing previous experience, our memories, our memories of our heartbreaks, of our betrayals, those lustful episodes that nobody else knows about, our experiences with our siblings and the bullies and the ex-best friends, you know, the lies we told, the lies that people told about us, and every good and bad thing in between our memories. Why do memories need to be transformed or reframed or redeemed? Because they will color the way that we see God. They will also color the way we see ourselves and others. And because our memories help us to form the second thing that isn't instantly transformed, our mindsets, our mindsets, our fixed attitudes, 
our habitual ways of thinking. I shared with the first service. I used to have this terrible habit of always just thinking doom and gloom. So if my husband didn't answer his phone while he was at work when we first got married, he was always dead. Always. He works in HVAC, so he's always like ladders. And he would tell me these stories about electrocuting himself all the time. And so I would be like, oh, my God. He didn't answer the phone. He's dead. He's electrocuted. I knew it. You know, like every day I was struggling. And I remember when the Lord was like, we're done with this. You can't think like that anymore. I've got Dale. I'm going to take care of him. Like I had to kick that habit mindsets, earthly mindsets like I must have the approval of certain people to feel okay about myself. The problem with that mindset is it will keep you living, keep you from living by faith and pleasing God, and it will cause you to live by fear, and you're trying to please people, right? We've got to deal with earthly mindsets like, I must meet certain standards to feel okay about myself. And we all know that's a problem because some days are really good and then others are really bad. And then if we're not careful, we can become self-righteous, right? We have to deal with earthly mindsets like, people who fail are unworthy of love and deserving of punishment. That's a dangerous mindset for a Christ follower because it will keep us from living loved and it will keep us from loving others in return. And how about this one? I am what I am. I cannot change. My excuse, people. Everybody has an uncle. Okay, I'm done. That's just who I am, girl. I'm 59 years old. You ain't changing me now right? And you're like, oh, uncle. But it's not just him. It's us too. That's our earthly mindset. I am what I am. I cannot change because it denies the power of God. Ephesians 3, 20 says that with the the power, God's power that's working in us is able to accomplish in us exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask or imagine. And if I don't deal with my mindset that that's just the way I am, I don't get to see the exceedingly abundantly above. We must confront our unbiblical, empty, earthly mindsets because they will always keep us from accepting and becoming who Jesus died for us to be. We got to deal with our memories. We've got these old mindsets. And then we have our mannerisms, huh? Our habits, the way we talk, the way we treat people, the things we eat at 11 p.m. Come on, somebody. I told everybody in the first service, and I know I talk about it all the time, but it's real, y'all. I have to eat gluten-free for my health. And they came out with gluten-free Oreos a few years back. Right? It's, 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 mm, it's a habit. If they get in the house, it's over. I, I haven't kicked it yet. Pastor Andy, pray for me. Okay, I need, right? We have these habits. Listen to me. If you've cussed like a sailor since you were 22... Or you have a habit of venting your anger on whoever is closest to you. Don't be surprised if it takes a while for that habit to transform. And also, don't let anybody convince you that God doesn't want to transform it. Because there's a lot of that going around. That's not biblical. God absolutely wants to transform it. And don't think for a minute that you can do it by yourself. You need and I need the power of the Holy Spirit to change the way that we think and feel and live. All right, how do we do it? How do we let the Holy Spirit work? 
I'm going to answer that by telling you two stories, one true story, one made-up story. And then I'm going to give you some instructions in between. First, we're going to look at a story in John chapter 11 and see it as an example of what it looks like to let the Holy Spirit work on and in you. Many of you know this story. We just sang about him, Lazarus. Jesus has this friend who he loves so much, and he's got two sisters, Mary and Martha. He falls deathly ill, and the sisters send someone to go get Jesus because they know he can heal him. But Jesus doesn't go. He delays. And then by the time he gets to where they are, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Jesus shows up. He talks to Martha. And then he sees Mary. And we'll pick it up in verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Bible trivia champions unite. What is the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. Hmm. God cries. Verse 36. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. Martha objects. She's like, just in case you didn't know Jesus, he's going to stink. And then Jesus reassures her, I got this, right? And then he prays to the Father for the benefit of those that are standing around. And then we pick it up in verse 43. Jesus called in a loud voice, come on, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Come on, somebody. So here's the picture. Let's try to see it. Lazarus was dead. Can we agree? Just like we are spiritually dead in our trespasses and our sins before we come to know Christ. But then Lazarus is raised to new life. Just like we are raised to new life in Christ through the Holy Spirit. This is where we all begin our journey. But notice, Lazarus was alive, yet he was bound. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Can you see it? And just like Lazarus, we all have some things that bind us from time to time. Things that we get wrapped up in. Those memories, those mindsets, those mannerisms. That earthly nature that wants to be resurrected. <laughs> but now through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can actually put it to death. His face was wrapped. This means he could not see or speak clearly. And he probably couldn't think clearly either because you have to remember, what's the last thing this man remembers doing? Dying. His hands and feet were bound, which means he could not walk or move the way God had intended. Lazarus's grave clothes needed to be removed. He no longer needed them because he was no longer dead. Come on. He was alive. He had to take those clothes off and put on something new. And this is where the work of the Holy Spirit comes in. 
like the people called to come alongside Lazarus and free him from his grave clothes, the Holy Spirit comes alongside us. In John chapter 14, when Jesus describes the Holy Spirit that is coming in the original Greek, it's this word paraclete. And the definition is called to one's aid, an advocate, a comforter, a helper. This is the Holy Spirit. It also speaks of Jesus. This is who God wants to be in our lives if we will let him. The Holy Spirit comes alongside, and in one reference I read said, this person would be able to make the right judgment calls (laughs) because they were close enough to the situation to really understand what was needed. This is what the Holy Spirit wants to do for us. He wants to come close enough into our lives that we will allow him to make the judgment calls and we will do what he says when he says it. The Holy Spirit wants to come close to you and he wants to do a work that only he can do. He wants to remove anything that is not pleasing to God and he wants to start with your thinking because he knows that's where everything flows from. Lazarus' story is amazing. Can we agree? (laughs) The Bible tells us that because of this miracle, many more people believed in Jesus. Lazarus became a walking, breathing witness. Think about it. To the power and majesty of God. It's a picture. It's an example. And if we will lean in and let the Holy Spirit work in our lives, if we will go through the process instead of fighting the process, we too will become credible witnesses to the saving and transforming power of Christ. And isn't that what we want to be? We must allow him to do the work, which, newsflash, will require something of us to participate in the work that the Holy Spirit is doing. We must admit. (laughs) We must acknowledge the truth. We start by acknowledging this truth. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. That's where we all begin, but we don't stop admitting after that. We must admit every day, Holy Spirit, I need your help. I can't do this on my own. We must admit the truth about ourselves. I am a liar. (laughs) I do like to gossip. I do throw my anger around. We must be honest with God. I don't know how to talk. I don't know how to walk. I don't know how to think like a new creation. He already knows it. We have to admit it. And as we walk with him for a while, we start admitting things like, Holy Spirit, you're right. I'm wrong. We must admit, and we must also submit. To submit, it's the action or fact of accepting or yielding to a superior force or to the authority or will of another person. First things first, we must accept that the Holy Spirit has authority over our lives. And then we must yield to his authority. You know, sometimes that yield is just a simple pause. The longer I walk with God, the more I understand that. It's just giving the Holy Spirit a chance (laughs) to help me say the right thing. Anybody? 
to help me refrain from doing that old thing, that simple pause, that shh, so you can actually hear what the Holy Spirit is trying to say. Any fast drivers in the room? Come on, they were honest in first service. Put your hands up in the air and wave. I'm like, come on, we're going to start a group. Hey, no, I'm kidding. Pray for us. When you're driving fast, come on, fast drivers, and you come up on a yield sign, it can be so inconvenient. I know the exact yield sign that I hate the most in Bossier City. I know it. I can see it in my mind. If we get into a habit of just blowing through yield signs and not paying attention to see if a car is coming, what's going to happen? Yeah, we're going to die. Amen. Somebody said, we're going to get in an accident, right? We must yield to his authority. And we must yield to his will because his will is God's way. I have to come up with little things to say because I can just be so disobedient when I don't want to be. And one of the things that I have start saying to God out loud is I give way to your way. I give way to your way. We must learn how to stop fighting and start moving the way the Holy Spirit moves and start thinking and walking in a manner that pleases God Submission sounds a lot like this phrase, you are God, I am not, so your will be done. You are God, I am not, so your will be done. We admit, we submit, and then we must commit. I will do it your way again and again, and again, until your way becomes my way too. Ah, this is the whole point of sanctification. Our thoughts become the same as his thoughts. His way becomes our way too. And when we trip up, what do we do? We start over. We admit. That was stupid. Anybody ever say that to God? Uh Uh-huh, right? And then we submit. Okay, I'm going to do it your way this time. And then we commit. And we do it in every other order. And we do it all over and over and over again. Okay. I promised you a made-up story. So here we go. (laughs) I kind of wanted to title this sermon, Let Him Cook. Some of you know what that means. Some of you don't. I'll explain it later. Don't worry about it. And when that thought came into my head, the very next thing I did was pick up my phone and call my 20-year-old daughter who is sitting over here. Because she's super cool, and she's all Gen Z and amazing. And I was thinking to myself, if I say that phrase from the stage, she might walk out of service. So let me call her and see, can I say this? So I said, hey, this thought just popped into my head. I think I might say this phrase on the stage. And guess what happened? She hung up on me. And I thought we had just gotten disconnected. So I called her back and I was like, hey, what had happened? And she said, I hung up on you. But I got her permission in the end. And so that phrase popped into my head, and it led me to write this short story that I think will help us. It's just another example of what life with the Holy Spirit can look like if we're not careful. Once upon a time, there was a man named Bob. Hi, Bob. One day, Bob won a contest, and the prize was having a three-star Michelin master chef come and live in his house and cook all his meals for the rest of his life. Now, Bob had never cooked a day in his life. 
One day, Bob asked the master chef to come into the kitchen because Bob wanted to cook the chef's award-winning recipe and show him what he could do. And instead of asking the chef for advice, Bob asked him to sit back, be quiet, and watch. Bob got out all of the ingredients, or so he thought, and then started throwing the recipe together from memory, but the only problem is Bob has a terrible memory. And his attitude when things don't go right isn't the best either. So stuff started burning and boiling over, and that caused him to get angry and start rushing and skipping some steps. And in the frenzy of trying to make this meal, he opened up the wrong cabinet, and instead of grabbing for pepper, he grabbed for poison. Immediately, the chef sat up in his chair and decided to speak up, but he was not one to scream, so he softly cautioned, Hey, Bob, I think you grabbed some poison. What was that? Bob screamed back, because he also was hard of hearing. The chef spoke softly again, I think you grabbed some poison. Shh! I told you, be quiet. Sit back and watch. La, 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 la. So the master chef, who knew that the recipe was not just going to taste bad, but that what Bob had just done would lead to death, sat in sadness. Because he also knew this. Bob was not going to listen. Let him cook. It's a Gen Z phrase, and I think it's a good one. It means to let someone continue what they are doing, even if it seems unusual or has an unclear outcome. And let me just tell you, if you're new to this thing, This is what it can be like when we open up our life to the work of the Holy Spirit. When we just start reading the word and attempting to imitate the life of Christ, sometimes it seems unusual. We read things like, it is better to give than to receive. I don't know about you, but I like that receiving part. You said it's better to give? It's better. That's not usual. Love your enemies. Bless them. Pray for them. Excuse me? That's unusual. Hold on, Holy Spirit. Just, just sit there. Let me, just one, maybe, let me make one more phone call. Now, I told you that if you had just blah, 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 right? And we think, I'm going to make them feel bad, and I'm going to get the outcome I want if I just make one more phone call. And the Holy Spirit's sitting back like, I know it seems unusual, but I know what's best. You're right. It is unusual. It's supposed to be unusual. It's supernatural. Of course it's different. I'm different. I'm God. And I'm telling you, I know better than you. Let me make the judgment call. Stop fighting. Stop ignoring me. Oh, Bob. (sighs) I don't want to be like Bob. Here's what we have to believe. Here's a thought we have to go all in with. The Holy Spirit knows what he's doing. And when we ignore him and do it our way, the wrong way, it grieves him. Just think about that. 
Why would God be grieved? What would make God sad? I think it's possibly the same reason that we see Jesus crying before he resurrects Lazarus. Because he loves us deeply. Paul says, God loves us so deeply that it actually takes Holy Spirit power to understand how much God loves us. Think about that. He loves us deeply. And he knows when we do it our way instead of his way, it's going to hurt us deeply. And it's probably going to hurt other people too. What would make God sad? Why would he be grieved? Because he hates death. He hates death. The Bible says that death is the last enemy to be conquered. Something we have to understand. Death as we know it was never supposed to exist. God hates death. And here's what he knows. Sin breeds death. Sometimes literal, physical death. And we know stories of people who have died in their sin. But it also brings death of marriages. And death of careers. And death of our joy. And death of our peace. I think about Bob's story. What if he had just admitted I don't know how to cook. (laughs) And then ask the chef to come alongside him and help him complete the recipe. And then what if Bob had just submitted to the chef's gentle correction? Hey, no, 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 not that. No, no, try that. Okay, right. And then what if Bob had committed? I'm going to show up in this kitchen with the chef every day for a year and do this every single night. You think Bob might have been a master chef when it was all said and done? Let's not be like Bob. (laughs) He had access to a master, and yet he did not allow him to teach him or show him the way. Let's let the Holy Spirit work. Do your part, read your Bible. Pray, go to her group, join freedom class, do your part. Admit every single day, Holy Spirit, I'm weak, you're strong, help me. Submit. Stop going 90 to nothing, expecting God to catch up and do your life on your pace. Learn how to pause and give way to God's way. Stop pausing. and commit I know we want to control the outcomes of our life I know and this is why we don't live by faith but I'm telling you God knows what we need he knows best all right we're gonna go back into Ephesians one verse and then we're gonna go eat our barbecue Amen, or whatever you're eating today. Ephesians 4.1. I want you to hear this from the Apostle Paul. I want you to hear this from the saints who have gone before us. I want you to hear it from elders that you know. And if it's worth anything, I want you to hear it from me. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. I beg you, walk in a manner worthy of this high and beautiful calling to which you have been called. We have a high calling, and the only way we will achieve it, the only way we will live it, is through the power of of the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite pastors posted this the other day. He posted, God wants to do great things through you, 
but not before he wants to do great things in you. Let him. And might I add, God wants to do great things through you while he's doing great things in you. Let him. While he's working on you, be a witness to the good things he's already done and that he is doing in your life. Let the Holy Spirit work so that you can be a witness to the power and the majesty of our high king. Stand with me. God loves you so much. Hear me. He loves you so much. He knew that the life he was calling us to, we would never be able to do without him. So he sent his spirit to empower us so we could stop making excuses. I am what I am. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit in you can give you the ability to become who God is calling you to be. But you have to believe it. And then you have to participate in the transformation he's trying to bring about in your life. It's the only way. (laughs) It's the only way. So we're going to end the service the way we began the month of May. At the end of the first service in the month of May, we sang, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And Pastor Destiny said, when we sing this song, let's not think about like the room and the things and the church and even our house or whatever. Like, let's think about us. Let's welcome the Holy Spirit in here and in here so that we can become the credible witnesses God is calling us to be. Let me pray for you and then we're going to sing. Just close your eyes and bow your head. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Where will we be without you, Jesus? Thank you for loving us so much that you would die and then raise again. But you didn't stop there. You sent us a helper who would lead us and guide us into all truth, who would empower us to live like God in a fallen and broken world. Come on, just thank God right now for the Holy Spirit. God, we thank you. Father, I pray for everyone who can hear me right now. I pray that this week and even in this day, they would pause, they would yield, they would submit their lives to the good, good work of the Holy Spirit. And that they would go all in with becoming the witnesses you are calling them to be. In Jesus' name.